Okay, we're picking up here uh, with the nature of man, and uh, <clears throat> we believe that man is uh, consists of three parts, body, soul, and spirit, and uh, we see uh, this uh, particularly given, as, as was said, in uh, Hebrews 4.12, uh, where we see that the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. So the power of the Word of God is revealed in the fact that it's even able to make a distinction between the soul and the spirit. And so adding to that the body of man, we believe in the three parts of man. They're the tripartite uh, being of man or the three parts. Uh, and in review, we looked at the body of man, <clears throat> and the body, of course, is the material part of man. The soul of man, uh, the word soul indicating self conscious life, or the seat of our intellect and our emotions. And uh, through Scripture, um, we can see five uh, ways that the soul is is defined or described, or five contents of the soul. We looked at the heart, um, and the heart as being a place of intellectual life, emotional life, volitional life, or the place where we make choices, as well as spiritual life. And uh, now we look at the mind. The mind, and the mind is described as a place of knowledge and reason. Uh, there's two types of mind that, uh, minds that are described in Scripture. Uh, the first type of mind described in Scripture is the unsaved mind. And uh, we have several passages that describe the unsaved mind. First is Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And here we see the reprobate mind. Romans 1, 28, <clears throat> here the Bible says, "...and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge..." God gave them over to a reprobate mind. So <clears throat> the word probate means to test or the ability to test or to prove. Uh, we see that word described in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things. Now a reprobate mind is a mind incapable, uh, unable to prove what is right and wrong. And here, one of the judgments for those that continue to reject God, one of the worst judgments in verse 28 is this, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So sometimes we wonder today, why can uh, people of this world do things that are so ungodly and so unnatural uh, and so against the things of God. How can they do that? Uh, how can they not see what seems to be so common sense and just uh, understood facts? Well, part of the reason is because they have a reprobate mind and uh, that is part of the judgment for rejecting God. When we reject God, there's no telling uh, where we will end up or how far we will go away from uh, his truth and His Word. Um, sin will make fools of us. And so reprobate mind uh, is one way that the unsaved mind is, is described. Uh, secondly here, the second type of uh, description for the unsaved mind is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. And uh, there in Ephesians 4, 17, we see that the mind is vain. Ephesians 4, 17 a vain mind. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. Uh, that word vanity has the idea of, of emptiness or without purpose, aimless, empty. Uh, a vain mind is described in Ephesians 4.17. The third type of unsaved mind is described in Titus 1.15. Titus chapter 1 and verse 15, and this is the defiled mind. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and their conscience, conscience is defiled. So 
Here we have a mind or a situation where the understanding uh, is, is defiled. And um, that's a strong word and a description of, a, of the unsaved mind. Fourthly, the fourth type of unsaved mind is described in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, where we see the mind as it has been blinded. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. A blinded mind. And this blinded mind uh, is the work um, of the God of this world. He wants minds blinded, and by blinding minds, uh, his attempt is to keep the light of the gospel from shining into uh, those um, lost sinners. Satan is a blinder. He wants to blind people from God's truth. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, back to Ephesians 4, uh, in verse 17, we'd seen our second point, the vain mind, but it goes on in Ephesians 4, 18, we see our fifth type of unsaved mind, Ephesians 4, 18. The Bible here describes this as the darkened mind. Uh, verse 18 having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And so we see here the darkened mind and uh, goes along with a blind heart. So the unsaved mind is described as reprobate, as vain, as defiled, as blinded, and as darkened. Well, on the other hand, uh, with regard to the mind, we see the saved mind, and we have some descriptions of the saved mind. We're going to have eight of them, eight descriptions of the saved mind, and uh, these will be alliterated. So uh, we saw with regard to the mind, we saw the unsaved mind described, and now we're going to see descriptions, biblical descriptions of the saved mind, and uh, we'll see... Um, Eight of these. The saved mind. First, number one, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. This verse says, Jesus saith unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this mind uh, could be described as a sacrificial mind. Sacrificial. Okay, so we're to love the Lord. Love the Lord. Love the Lord with all heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And this is a heart, a, a mind that understands love, sacrificial mind. Isaiah 26.3 describes the second type of mind. Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3. Um, <clears throat> this is a secure mind. Secure mind. This passage says this, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. That is the secure mind. Thirdly, Romans 12, 3. I love this passage in Romans chapter 12. It is the passage that uh, the Lord used uh, in my life uh, as a college student to uh, give me real direction about uh, the next step uh, for uh, my life and, and following the Lord. So when I come to Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 8, they're special verses for me. Uh, the Holy Spirit got a hold of my heart, uh, uh, and I remember the time, I remember the place, and I remember the, the decision I had to make, and I'm grateful uh, that He used this passage uh, to give me a clear uh, 
clear understanding. And um, I have got um, in my Bible here a, a time and a date, a year written down, uh, circled in this passage. It's a special, special one for me. But uh, part of this passage describes the mind, and it's described in verse 3. Romans 12, 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to everyone that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Here the command is to think, uh, to think soberly, and the opposite of this is to think more highly uh, than um, one ought to think. And so uh, a sober mind is described in Romans 12, 3. A sober mind, a serious mind, or thinking of oneself honestly, uh, the sober mind. Number four with regard to the saved mind is found in James chapter 1 and verse 8. And this is the single mind, single mind, James 1, 8. And uh, James, a very practical book, and uh, the things that he presents for us are uh, very straightforward. And uh, this verse is one of those verses that states a lot of truth in a short amount of words. James 1.8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And uh, the word mind there is uh, sukos, where we get our word soul, and the mind's part of the soul. And so a man that is a split soul or a double-minded man, he's divided. He's unstable in all his ways. And uh, so the opposite of being double-minded is to be single-minded. And so James 1.8 will describe a, uh, give to us the opposite truth, which is uh, being single minded singleness of heart serving god if thine eye be single the body is full of light the bible says number five second timothy 1 7 we have a sound mind second timothy 1 7 <clears throat> this is a passage that many believers have gone to in times of great need and uh, times of trial um, and uh, the Lord has used this to bring comfort uh, and peace to troubled hearts, to troubled lives. And uh, He'll do the same for you. Uh, and uh, this is a verse that you want to commit to memory. And uh, when there's difficult times and uh, uncertainty in your life, it's going to happen. It happens to all of us. But this is a verse that we can go to. And this verse will give us... Um, uh, the ability to uh, rely on God and God's promises. Because it tells us what God has not given to us and what He has given to us. So 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. So when we find ourselves filled with fear and doubt and anxiety... Um, we know that that's not sourced in God. That is, um, that is uh, the human nature's response to trials or difficulties or things that are out of our control. And uh, when we find ourselves in a situation like that, it's very easy to, to begin to fret, uh, to uh, be filled with care, um, <clears throat> and to worry. And uh, the Lord here says... Uh, that's not from God. What has God given us? The rest of this verse says, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, the spirit of power, and the spirit of love, and the spirit of a sound mind. And uh, to know that from God comes um, these things is um, reassuring. A mind that's sound, it's stable, it's secure. So we have a sacrificial mind, a secure mind, a sober mind, a single mind. And now Romans 8, 6, we find described the spiritual mind. The spiritual mind. Romans 8, 6. Let's take a look there. Romans chapter 8. 
and verse 6. Here the Bible says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So here, the saved mind is described as a spiritual mind. So here we have, you know, the three parts of man, the body, soul, and spirit. Uh, spirit is a part of uh, our um, nature, and we'll see in a bit, that relates to God. And here, that part of our nature can be a part of our soul and our mind. We can have minds that are not uh, filled with worry and fear and envy and bitterness and wrath and anger and all those sins of the flesh, but we can have a mind that is controlled and, and, and in subjection to the Spirit. And a mind like that is a mind of life and peace. Uh, uh, the opposite is a carnal mind that's enmity against God and uh, can't please God, verse 8. Um, but the Bible says in verse 9, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Spiritual mind. Philippians 4, 8. I like this one as well. Uh, growing up in um, a Christian school, this is one of the first uh, passages that we learned, Philippians chapter 4. And uh, in the middle of this uh, great chapter is uh, Philippians 4, 8. <clears throat> And uh, we, we challenged, uh, we did, took on a challenge as a family uh, not too long ago, and that was to memorize Philippians chapter 4 and to say it, we had to say the whole chapter uh, to another member of our family uh, before we went on a special trip. And uh, so I remember as we were preparing for that, everybody's trying to memorize this chapter and uh, rem memorize these different parts. And we get to the chapter uh or verse 8 here in Philippians 4, um, there's kind of a list of things. And to get them all in the right order took a little extra time and a little extra thought. But it's a great verse to tell us what our mind or the mind of a saved person can and should be focused on and can be filled with. So Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brethren, what sort of things are true, what sort of things are honest, what sort of things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. This, by obeying this verse, we give to our minds a structure. And the structure is these six um, truths, these six characteristics, these six character traits that uh, a saved mind should be focused on to give it structure. Uh, this is things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report. Uh, you know, what we think about, um, if we don't give our mind structure for what it's going to think about, sometimes it will wander, and we'll often find ourselves wandering into the ways of the flesh wandering into thoughts about this world or wandering into a place where uh, worry and care take over. Um, but the strength of a disciplined mind is a, a wonderful uh, uh, situation for a Christian to be in, a disciplined mind and how do we get a disciplined mind? Well, this verse gives us six areas to meditate, to think on, to, to deliberately think on. Things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, uh, good report. Um, what do you find yourself thinking about during the course of the day? Do you find your mind wandering? Do you find yourself just not thinking about anything? Of course, the word amusement means uh, muse means to think or to meditate and the a in front of that negates it i don't think about anything i just want to be amused that's a plague it's a plague of christians today just seeking amusement whereas here uh, philippians 4 8 tells us to think to muse to meditate on definite things i think that uh, the mind that's seeking just amusement is, uh, is a mind that the devil is going to keep his eye out on because he can get to that mind pretty quickly, pretty easily. 
He'll find things to amuse us. Um, the Bible here commands us to think. Joshua 1, 8 commands us to meditate on God's Word day and night. So we want to find ourselves as saved people with a structured mind uh, to try to live the Christian life without that is just inviting the temptation of the devil. And then Philippians 2.5, we here have our chapter that deals with our Lord Jesus Christ. And we find something about Him that we are to emulate, and that is a submissive mind, submissive And this submissive mind <clears throat> is modeled by our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What type of mind did Jesus have? The verses that follow describe uh, the mindset of Jesus as being one of no reputation, of being a servant, of being humble, and of being obedient. That is very contrary to the ways of this world. That is very contrary to how this world says to get ahead. No reputation, serve, humility, obedience. And who's the one that is our example for this? Our Lord Jesus Christ Himself. And so... <clears throat> If we are going to have a submissive mind, we're going to live and look very different from this world system. Humble people obey. And Jesus was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, verse 8. So we're convicted when we think about this submissive mind when actually uh, who showed us that pattern or who gave us that pattern. And that's, that's our very Lord and Savior Himself. So, <clears throat> the contents of the soul. We looked at the heart as uh, one of the contents of the soul. And then uh, we just looked at the mind, number two, as a, a content of the soul. The heart, mind. And now number three, we'll take a look at the will. The will. This is sometimes called volition. Our volition. Um, <clears throat> the will. Some statements about the will of man. The will of man. A man may choose, number one, to be a servant of sin. He may choose to be a servant of sin. Um, there is, secondly, a need for salvation because no man can permanently change his will. In other words, no man can change his will to where he is sinlessly perfect. Uh, the only perfect uh, one to ever live was Jesus Christ. There's a need for salvation. Another thing we'd say about the will is that uh, decisions, when we make decisions, they should be made from our will, not just emotions. So <clears throat> the emotional life of man uh, with uh, its ups and downs is, is not a good foundation uh, for decision making. There needs to be that act of will and determination as well. Now, even that's not enough. We must, <laughs> for uh, any permanent change in our life, uh, have that as a source and the power of God in in the power of his word um, <clears throat> but uh, to make a, a decisions simply by emotions is not enough there must be an act of will as well when we repeat actions of our will those actions after a time become what we call habits and those habits can be good or those habits can be bad i don't know if this is a fact but I remember a preaching illustration when I was a young man that if you do something for 17 times in a row, it becomes a habit. So I, I guess we could test that out and find if that's the case. Um, but repeated acts of will become habit. That's why in rearing children, it's very important. 
that we are watching for their acts of will. And we're correcting those acts of their will as they happen, lest they become habits. And um, uh, the time for molding, uh, molding habits starts very young. Man is responsible. You and I are responsible for our will. We'd say that as well. So, components of the soul, the heart, the mind, the will. And now number four, the fourth part would be our conscience. Conscience. We find this concept, this word, not in the Old Testament, but 30 times in the New Testament. And we would call our conscience our moral awareness. Our moral awareness. This is not something that's acquired. This is something that's a part of our nature. A moral awareness. Now, that does not mean it's infallible or sinless. Some Christian groups um, have promoted the idea of letting this moral awareness or letting uh, their conscience be their guide. Let your conscience be your guide. I believe it may have been the Quakers that... Uh, Use the term inner light. Follow the inner light. Um, <clears throat> that inner light, unfortunately, may be helpful and may be beneficial, but it's certainly not infallible and not something that can be trusted like we can put our full faith and trust in the person of Jesus Christ and in the person of God and the Holy Spirit and our full faith and trust in God's Word. But uh, this conscience is described in Scripture several ways, uh, actually uh, nine ways, nine different types of uh, consciences are described in the Bible. And so we will uh, make, note, uh, make note of these uh, here as well. In John 8, 9, we see a convicting a convicting conscience. John chapter 8 and verse 9. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. So you might recognize this as the account of the woman caught in adultery. And through the teaching and the statements of Jesus, uh, there, these uh, consciences of these men that were her accusers, uh, these consciences were convicted. Convicted. Uh, the second type of conscience described in the Bible is a defiled conscience. Defiled. And we could find this in uh, 1 Corinthians Chapter 8 and verse 7, 1 Corinthians 8, 7, a defiled conscience. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. So here we can see here an action that uh, defiles a man's conscience. First uh, Timothy one, or excuse me, Titus one fifteen would describe this as well. Even their mind and conscience is defiled. We used Timothy one fifteen uh, to describe uh, one aspect of the unsaved mind. Uh, their mind is defiled, but here we see that the conscience is defiled uh, as well in Titus one fifteen. Hebrews 10.22, let's turn there, Hebrews 10.22, and there we will find a um, third description of the conscience of man, and uh, this is an evil conscience. So Hebrews 10.22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, an evil conscience. So certainly our conscience, this moral awareness is a benefit. It's part of our nature, but it's not infallible. 
and it cannot be trusted uh, <clears throat> to um, always guide us into God's truth because uh, consciences can become defiled. Uh, they can become evil. Number four, they can become, uh, so here's evil. Number four, they, they, conscience can become seared. Become seared. That's a strong word. Uh, 1 Timothy 4.2, uh, when we think about a seared conscience, we think about that word seared, and we think about something that's burned uh, thoroughly on the outside. On the inside, it's not. But searing is a surface um, uh, uh, burning, means seared, heated up and cooked very quickly. Uh, here, First um, Timothy uh, chapter 4, Paul begins this letter it's pointing out the fact that uh, the Spirit speaks expressly or uh, very distinctly or in very clear words. The Spirit speaks expressly. Uh, in other words, you're not going to misunderstand what he says here. Uh, that in the, last, uh, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and to doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That's a pretty graphic description of what that... Uh, Word is the word seared there is where we get our word to cauterize something. A seared conscience, enabling these uh, false teachers, these seducing spirits, to spread hypocritical lies. And then Ephesians 4.19 points out this as well. But on the other hand, there can be Hebrews 9.14, a purged, purged conscience. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. Let's look there. Hebrews 9.14. The Bible says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? What a blessing. What a blessing that part of the power of God and the blood of Christ through salvation is that our consciences are purged. Uh, our moral awareness is, comes in line with eternal truth of Scripture. Uh, and it throws off the dead works and, and leads us to serve the living God. What a blessing that is, that our conscience uh, doesn't have to stay defiled or evil or seared, it can be purged. And uh, this purging is not done by our own power or of our own merit, but it is through the eternal spirit um, and the blood of Christ. And um, we can have a purged conscience. Amen for that blessing of salvation. And uh, to think what God can do what all happens when a man is born again? He's born again. New life. New life. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. Uh, what a blessing that is. And the immensity and the extensiveness of our salvation. Um, I think that we will be um, on that topic for millions and millions and millions of years uh, in eternity. Uh, the magnificence, uh, the wonderful uh, truths uh, of our salvation and uh, the fact that God loved a sinner such as I and uh, came and gave his life in my place and uh, cleansed my sin and purged my conscience. We thank the Lord for all that He's done. Number six, described in Scripture, we see a pure conscience. Pure. 1 Timothy 3.9. 1 Timothy 3.9. Here the Bible says, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. So here's uh, another description of a 
of, of a conscience that's pure. What a blessing to have a, a pure conscience. You know, one of those consciences that you can lay down at night and sleep in peace. We thank the Lord for that. Paul says this in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Paul had a lot of problems in his life, a lot of trials. He had problems with the, uh, the civil authorities. He had problems uh, with fellow believers. He had physical problems. He had the thorn in his flesh that he really wanted God to, to relieve him of. He had problems stacked on top of problems, but you know what he didn't have? He didn't have a defiled conscience. You know what he did have? He had a pure conscience, one that allowed him to sleep in peace at night, knowing that he was serving the Lord with all that he had. And uh, you can have that same type of conscience. But <clears throat> when we sneak and when we cut corners, and when we try to hide things, uh, when we're trying to just get by and do the, the bare minimum, uh, we, we may save ourselves some time. We might get a good grade on a test that we would, would not have, uh, but there's something far more valuable than just getting a good grade on a test. There's something far more important than simply um, impressing uh, those that you're working with. And that's the, the ability to have the peace of God rule in your heart, uh, free from uh, this idea of hiding and sneaking and sinning and cutting corners. Uh, so let me encourage you, uh, as you're going through this course and all your courses, do it thorough. Do it right. Don't cheat. Don't start that habit. Uh, you'll get your grade at the end of the semester, but in the back of your mind, there'll be a, a little voice saying, yeah, you know what? You didn't really deserve that. You know what you did. You, you, you know that's not uh, an honest grade. It might look good, but it's not what you deserve. And so <clears throat> as we consider these types of consciences, we have to consider what, what, what type of life do you want to live? Um, boy, how valuable is it to, to live in peace, to have a pure conscience? There's no, there's no grade, there's no score uh, on a test that's worth sacrificing uh, a clean purged, clear, good conscience. Good is number seven, a good conscience. And this good conscience is found in uh, Acts 23 and verse 1. Acts 23 and verse 1. Here the Bible says, And Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience, before God until this day. Now, Paul stated that, and as soon as those words came out of his mouth, look at verse 2, um, <clears throat> he got smitten on the mouth. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by to smite him on the mouth. And uh, <clears throat> you see how this um, trial was going to go from the very start. Paul said, I've lived in good conscience. Ananias uh, had Paul uh, hit on the mouth as a result of that. But Paul was telling the truth. When he saw the light, literally, on the road to Damascus, he responded to it, and he, and he answered Jesus, and he saw him as his Savior and Lord, and he got up, and he obeyed every step of the way. He was a young Christian, and Barnabas came alongside of him and helped him and taught him. And they together went to the church of Antioch. And there they worked. And as far as Paul knew, he probably just thought, hey, this is where the Lord's going to have me at the rest of my life. But then the Holy Spirit came along and said, ah, okay, of these men that are in this church, I want two of them for a different work. And the Holy Spirit said, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work whereunto I've called them. Acts 13. 
And then Paul followed God. And Paul and Barnabas traveled on that first missionary journey. And then, uh, then he continued to travel, continued to follow God. In other words, as God guided him, he obeyed God. He didn't uh, disobey God and have to regret uh, what he was doing or what he wasn't doing. He had a good conscience. He was obeying uh, God's direction as it came. And then number eight... We have the conscience that's void of offense. Acts 24, verse 16. Back to Paul again. And he says this, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense. And notice this, toward God and toward man. There are those that try to have a good conscience before man but inside their heart, they know that they've done things God sees. Man might not see it. Man is, might look at them as a really good Christian, but they know in their heart uh, that they have sinned before God. Their conscience before man is good, but before God, they're guilty. There are others who uh, try to say, well, I'm going to have a good conscience before God, but I'm going to mistreat man. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm going to... Uh, 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 live my life in, in such a way to get what I need to get, what I'm going to get, and if people get in my way, then that's their fault. And, um, you know, their conscience before man is poor, wrong. Paul said, there's two aspects in my life that I'm working on. There's two aspects. I want to have a conscience that's void of offense toward God, but not only toward God, also toward man. And that type of conscience required a lot of what we would call self-control, what might be better called spirit-filled living, um, a lot of speaking to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, uh, a lot of obedience to Scripture, a lot of saying no to what we want or how we want to react and yes to God and God's word and God's ways, even if it runs afoul of our emotions or our wishes. Uh, what's Paul saying here in Acts 24, 16? He's saying a lot. Herein do I exercise myself. In other words, it was a deliberate choice. It was deliberate. And it was um, not something that happened automatically. In other words, I exercise myself. I determine... I determine to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and man. That does not happen by accident. It will not happen by accident. That is an act, yes, of the heart and mind, but also it's an act of the will. And then 1 Corinthians 8, lastly here, number 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 10. Uh, we're going to see another uh, conscience described here, 1 Corinthians 8, 10. Here the Bible says, For if any man see thee which hast knowledge set at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? Verse 12, But when ye sin, so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience... Ye sinned against Christ. So there are Christian brothers who have a weak conscience and um, believers should be careful to not wound or damage that believer's um, weak conscience. And so there is um, uh, an extra level of cautiousness that we should exercise as Christians in our Christian life. All right, so these are nine scriptural types of consciences. Convicting, defiled, evil, seared, purged, pure, good, void of offense, and weak. Okay, so now we're looking at the contents of um, the soul. We've looked at the heart, the mind, the will, the conscience, and now uh, number five, uh, we'll see the flesh.
flesh. And um, the flesh is described um, throughout uh, Romans, Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 8. We realize those that are in the flesh cannot please God. Um, what is the flesh? Well, I'll summarize this pretty quickly. Uh, flesh in one sense is just the material part of our body, but in the spiritual sense, flesh is the part of man which because of the fall is opposed to God and to holiness. The flesh is opposed to God and it's opposed to holiness. It's an enemy of God. It's an enemy of holiness. And together with the other two axes of evil, <laughs> the world and the devil, the world, the devil and the flesh form a triumvirate of uh, personal enemies that you and I are going to face. Um, <clears throat> And Scripture, much of Scripture, is dedicated to showing us how we win the victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. Showing us that we can win the victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. Um, <clears throat> the flesh is opposed to God. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans chapter 8. So uh, we have the flesh. All right. So the world is out there, and the devil's out there. But the flesh, it's part of us, part of the soul. And uh, it's an all-out enemy of God.